Okay, so here we go with the second half of our introduction. Um, it's a couple different topics here, two or three. So, but they're both for, they're they're all very short. So we'll go through it fairly quickly. Uh, the first is Fermi uh, estimates. That is a picture of Enrico Fermi there, the gentleman who was famous for doing these. Um, it's it's something of a trick involving orders of magnitude that can give you approximate answers, useful answers, without having to go through a great deal of calculation, and sometimes without even knowing any of the information. Um, there are some famous ones of these where some of the information is just straight up guesswork. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes an exact answer isn't available to you, isn't within your means, um, or you just aren't ready for it yet. You want to get an order of magnitude estimate, um, nobody's life is at stake here, and you, you test it out. So there are mathematical reasons um, why you might not be able to get an answer, or you might just be short on information at the moment, and the Fermi method might be useful to you. More than anything, it's just something they teach physics students as as a way to get your brain working. It's a, it's a fun brain puzzle, more than anything. All right. <clears throat> so you can use it as a check of your exact answers when you finally get the exact calculation to see if things are, are sensible. A physicist always wants to look for a sensible answer, um, not just the mathematical answer. You check your answers to see if they make sense in the physical world. They always involve order of magnitude. Um, and our method for doing it is going to be very specific about that. We're going to talk about exponents. Your exponents are your order of magnitude. So you're going to make an approximation, um, and you're going to make a bunch of assumptions. <clears throat> you're going to make estimates within the assumption that some are too high and some are too low. So if you try to make this problem too simple, you won't get as good an answer as when you make a bunch of different estimates because you want to balance that out. The times you estimate too high should sort of cancel out with the times that you estimate too low. Um, and later on, if you set it up in the factor label sort of method, you can later on go in, put in the actual numbers when you get them, and uh, the setup is already done for you, right? All right. <clears throat> so order of magnitude is the power of 10 that something applies to. So every number we're going to put in to our factor label method here is going to be 10 to the something. So the number 30, you wouldn't write 30. If you're going to guess that there are 30 people in the room, you're going to say that there's 10 to the 1, which is um, 10, right? Um, if there are 500, you'd say that there's 10 to the 3, 1,000. Gonna round up, even though that's right in the middle. Six billion is ten to the ten. Well, that's sort of the the hard one. So here's our example: How many piano tuners are there in New York City? And I will uh, walk you through this with you. Give me just a moment. Okay, the question of how many piano tuners are there in New York City? Um, a, a bizarre question. Um, how are you supposed to know? How are you supposed to figure it out? You're not supposed to know, and you are supposed to estimate. You're going to use two things, the factor label method and this Fermi um, estimation method, which involves just powers of 10. So remember that. Factor label, powers of 10 only. Okay. So you start with a blank conversion factor, as you would with a normal factor label problem. What is it you want to change? You want to change New York City right, into piano tuners. So I have one city, um, and I put a one underneath it to make a fraction out of it, right? This is the thing I'm going to change. One city, I'm going to change into piano tuners. Draw a blank conversion factor. I don't know what goes in here yet, but I know city's got to go on the bottom, right? City's not what I want. Got to get rid of it. Um, what do I know about New York City? Piano tuners are people, so maybe that's a good place to start. How many people live in New York City? I have no idea. Do not go look it up. That's not what this is about. If you do that, you ruin it. The thing is to either estimate too high or too low, as often as not. All right, I know there aren't a million people in New York City. There are more. I know there are probably not a hundred million people in New York City. I think it's ten. It's not ten, I think it's like twelve. But I know it's, it's, it's more than one million, less than a hundred million. I'm going to go with ten million. One million is ten to the six, so ten million is uh, ten to the seven. 
I'm estimating that there are about 10 to the 7 people in New York City. You may estimate differently. You may estimate 10 to the 8 here. But in another place, you'll estimate lower the other way. Or we'll get an, um, a number that is off by an order of magnitude. But you'll be shocked at how often we are in the right order of magnitude when we do this process. That's kind of the fun of it. Uh, people gotta go. Sounds bad, but people gotta go. Um, we want to turn people into piano tuners. I think we're gonna go by way of pianos. Doesn't that make sense, right? So how many pianos does each person own? Ten? No. Each person doesn't own a piano, right? It's the other way around. I would say there's one piano, more than one for every hundred people, but definitely less than one for one. So it's got to be one to ten. Remember, you can only have powers of ten. So I would say one piano for every hundred people. Ten to the two. Uh, looks like I went with 10 to the 2 here, instead of 10. Um, just as a guess. In New York City, you got to have space. So, just a guess. You might put 10 to the 1 there. That's okay. Alright, um, so now i got to get rid of pianos, and I want to go to pi from pianos to piano tuning. And I know the pianos need to be tuned every once in a while, but not, not too often, right? So I'm going to go from pianos to tunings per year. Um... Just as a guess, I'm going to say one piano needs to be tuned every, maybe it's not every year, but it's definitely not every hundred years, uh, every ten years. Every ten to the minus one tunings per year. Be real careful here, this year looks like it's on the top of the fraction, but it's actually on the bottom of the fraction, right? It's tunings per year, it's actually down here, it's on the bottom of the fraction. And uh, year's got to go, but since it's really on the bottom of the fraction there, i got to put it on the top of the fraction in the next line. That's a tr something that'll throw you. But one of the cool things about the factor label method you can do. Um, I'm interested in how many piano tuners, uh, how many tunings he can do per day, not per year. So I'm going to go from years to days. You might skip this step. You might go a totally different way. And that's okay. One year, you're going to say 365 days. The real thing is 365.24. But do not use either of those. They are wrong for this method. You can only use powers of 10. Are there 10 days in a year? Are there 100 days in the year? Are there 1,000 days in the year? Those are your only choices. And I'm going to say it's closer to 100 than 1,000. 10 to the 2. All right, um, so maybe I've lost track of units now. I'm going to go back and just cross out stuff, right? I got city on the top, city on the bottom. <clears throat> I need to get to piano tuners. People can go, people can go. I just want piano tuners left. Pianos, pianos. Um, years are there, years are there, Put one on bottom, one on top. Um, so days have to go, right? Um, and tunings have to go. So I can do tunings per day down here. This is actually up top, right? This is the bottom of a bottom of a fraction. And I can take a guess as to how many tunings per day a piano tuner can do. Can a piano tuner tune one piano a day? Ten pianos a day? A hundred pianos a day. It's probably close to the middle guy. It's probably close to a hundred. Yeah? One piano tuner. Uh, I'm sorry, 10. Probably closer to 10. Not 100 a day. I mean, they probably take like an hour a piece. So it's probably more like 8 or, uh, or even 5. So if you go 1 a day or 10 a day, I think you're going to be in the right ballpark. Right? Um, so days go. And tunings from up there. Tunings from down here. Go. And we're left with just piano tuners. So the interesting question is, how do we get our answer? Um... I was only supposed to use powers of 10s, but you notice I used 1s. 1 is a power of 10, it's 10 to the 0, yeah? But a 0 um, isn't counting for anything here, right? We're going to add all of the exponents in the top and subtract all of the exponents in the bottom, and 10 to the 0 exponent is 0. Adding 0 doesn't do anything. Isn't that nifty? So we're going to do 7, right? Plus a negative 1 is 6. Minus 2 is 4. Minus 2 is 2. We should be about 10 to the 2 piano tuners in New York City. Is that unreasonable? Should there be about 100 piano tuners in New York City? Yeah. You might have gotten 10. That's probably too low. You might have gotten 1,000. That's probably too high. 100 might be too low or too high, but it's going to be closer than the other two orders of magnitude. So a Fermi estimate only gets you within an order of magnitude. All right, our next topic is coordinate systems. I'm going to do... There are a bunch of different coordinate systems possible. Choosing the right coordinate system is a matter of 
not so much taste as, as it is making the problem easy. If you choose the wrong coordinate system, the problem becomes much more difficult than it needs to be. We're only going to use two pretty simple coordinate systems in this class, though, so no need to get scared. Some of the, the crazier three-dimensional ones um, we're just not going to get into. It's a little beyond our math needs. All right. So coordinate systems are exist for the purpose of describing how where things are in space and how things move in space. So normally you have you can have a three dimensional space. We're going to keep things very two dimensional in this course for the sake of making the math easy. This is not a math course; it's a physics course, so we we can get away with that without feeling guilty. So you need a couple things if you're going to have a coordinate system. Excuse me. The first thing you want is a reference point, an origin. And that can be anywhere that's of your choosing. But if you are wise and choose it in the proper place, you, the math becomes more easy. Um, that takes a little experience. Don't be afraid to ask me for a little help with that. Um, and then you want to choose um, axes. And depending on the type of coordinate system you have, you might have different types of axes. You're used to the Cartesian coordinate system, I'm sure, where you have X and Y. Right? That's your coordinate system. You could have a Z if you wanted to get three-dimensional. Um, but like I said, we won't go there very often. There are times in, in when we study magnetism um, and a few other things where we have to add a third dimension. So, but we'll try to keep that simple. So then you have to have some sort of instruction, um, some sort of method of labeling the position um, with respect to the origin and the axis. Right? You're used to this. Um, it's a little strange maybe to think about the nature of coordinate system, and you're, you're probably wondering why I'm doing this. It's because in physics we have so many different types of coordinate systems. It's important for us to know what they have in common so that you as a physicist may need to develop your own coordinate system at some point or to tweak your own. So uh, our different types of coordinate systems, um, the first two we're going to look at we'll actually use, the second two we won't um, in this class. So the Cartesian coordinate system you're used to, two dimensions x, y, three dimensions x, y, z. Nothing really new there. Hopefully you've worked a little bit in your math classes with plane polar coordinates, P-L-A-N-E, as in they are in a plane. Um, they are by definition two-dimensional. In order to go three-dimensional, so you need a different type of system. So this is what our, our plane polar coordinates looks like, right? Here are two um, two variables are r, your distance away from the origin, and theta, your distance up from some reference axis. Adding to that uh, a height dimension, you can make cylindrical coordinates, so it's plane polar at the bottom here, and then you add a z-axis uh, to that. Um, and the last is spherical, definitely the most difficult. You have r, your distance from the origin. You have um, a reference angle in the xy plane and a reference angle down from the z axis. So two different angles in there, so a lot more trigonometry. Um, very useful for lots of different things if you're going to someday grow up and pilot a spacecraft. That's the, that's the unit system for you. <clears throat> Cartesian coordinate system, the also called the rectangular coordinate system you are most familiar with. You will have a position x, y, a point x, y, corresponding to your x, y axes. And um, yeah, we use this a lot. We use this probably 99% of the time, or 95% of the time. Uh, the other times we will use the plane polar system. Um, this one will take a little more practice. There are times when this is absolutely necessary. For instance, when we are dealing with a rotating object, um, during that whole that whole unit, you're going to be using mostly plane polar coordinates. You'll have r's and thetas and uh, the change. And the changing between those two coordinate systems, the Cartesian and the polar, um, is going to be a big deal, a big part of it. So we'll practice that math a little bit, though it's not terribly difficult. With a little trigonometry. Um, so here, r is your distance from the origin, right? From your... Or wherever you choose that origin to be. And R is the point is R is your distance away from that. And then theta is your angle up from some reference line, usually your x equals zero axis when you trade back and forth between the coordinates, though that's entirely up to you. So as a quick review for trigonometry, the trigonometry you need to know is the simplest trigonometry. You may still be in a pre-calculus class, but hopefully you've seen some sines and cosines. If not, Please come see me. We can we can work with this. Okay, um, it's pretty easy. The whole Sokotoa thing. Yes, your sine is opposite over hypotenuse. 
the so. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse ka. And the toa, t, is tangent o is opposite over adjacent. So it's involving right triangles, yes? You have an angle, it's always in reference to the angle. So here, y is the opposite. But if we were talking about this angle here, x would be the opposite. So you can't always depend on this here. In this case, the sine of theta is y over r, but that's only because we chose this theta. If we were instead looking at this theta, we would have to rethink that. So don't necessarily memorize the y over r, the x over r, the y over x. That depends on the angle you choose, right? Um, which depends on where you put your coordinate system. So if you wanted to invert your coordinate system, you can get away with that. I think, I think the Sokotoa is much easier to work with. Obviously, we're going to practice this in class quite a bit. The Pythagorean theorem is our old friend, and we will use it a lot, especially because we're dealing with right triangles all the time, right? So um, our hypotenuse was R in this case. Notice I'm mixing the language of the Cartesian and the polar coordinates. So R squared is X squared plus Y squared. Um, and whether opposite or adjacent in this case doesn't matter because the addition is commutative. Finding the angle, you use an inverse trig function, which is one of the reasons why you need a, a slightly fancier calculator than you might otherwise. Um, the angle here, um, is, you might know the sine of it is, um, you know, A over B or whatever, and you need to find the inverse sine in order to find the angle. Big deal is we will often be working in... Um, degrees, but when we get to actual rotational motion stuff, radians becomes very, very crucial. The reason why radians were invented for to make the physics easy for this. And so you will need to make sure you can train uh, your calculator to go back and forth between radians and degrees and pay attention. What is it in? Check it um, every time. Oh, look, I anticipated myself here. Um, <clears throat> the inverse tangent of 0.577 is 30 degrees, but it's 0.5 radians, right? They're very different units. I'm going to teach you these when we get to the appropriate section. I'm going to teach you about radians a little bit, if you haven't seen it already. So tr going back and forth between rectangular and polar, this is something you want to put in your notebook. I, I have trouble memorizing it sometimes, but you can just use the Pythagorean theorem to figure it out for yourself. Um, and what little trigonometry you know will, will get you there. So you can find r, if you happen to know the x and y coordinate, you find r by using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, and you can use the inverse tangent of x and y to find the angle involved. You want to be a little bit careful. The inverse tangent tells you this angle here, right? It doesn't tell you the whole, the whole angle over. So you sometimes have to add 180 to your answer when you're taking an inverse tangent. It's the difference between the domain and the range, right? So going from polar to rectangular, you want to know x. It's just r times the cosine of the angle, right? r times the cosine of the, the angle here gives you the x-coordinate. And r times the sine of the angle gives you the y-coordinate there, right? You may have to worry about your pluses and minuses. You have to sort of know where that is. So a sketch is super important anytime you want to convert between rectangular and polar. Make sure you draw a sketch. All right. Um, our last topic here is a problem-solving strategy. The book has these in every unit, every new idea. Um, I won't mention them often, but this is the basic one, the basis that the other ones are built off of, and it's a pretty good one. And I'll solve a problem using it at the end. Uh, read the problem. I'm going to read the problem more than once, but begin by reading it once. Um, identify the nature of the problem. What is it that you are being asked to find? I, that, it's not always obvious, but hopefully you can figure that out. If you don't know what you're being asked, it's impossible to answer. Yes? Draw a diagram always, always in physics. Um, sometimes they're going to be very specific diagrams that you need to draw. Something called free body diagrams or other diagrams that get you towards the answer. But always draw something, right? All right. Label the physical quantities. All right. Um, on your diagram, label who's what, what letters you want to use. You get to totally make up what what sort of notation system. They, that doesn't really matter. It's just going to help you with the algebra, right? Keep it simple, but also keep it clear. Sometimes you'll see variables with one or two little subscripts, 
that's not done to confuse you. It's done to to make the math easy and make it so you don't get mixed up as to who which variable is which. Um, make a list of all your different data, things given to you, and then make one. So they're asking you for velocity. You've written down, I know the, the distance is 12 meters and the time is 30 seconds. Velocity equals question mark. I don't know. I like to put that in so I know what I'm looking for. But I also know that that variable V is going to be in the formulas that I'm looking for. Okay? This helps you choose the equations. You look at all the things that you know and the thing that you are looking for, and that shows you the variables that you want to be in your equation. If you have an equation that has a variable that isn't in your this data at all, it's probably not the right equation for you. Finding the right equation, knowing the equations, is your primary job in physics. It's the, probably the one thing that I will not help you with. When you ask me on a test, which equation should I use, that's your job. It's your job to write them all down, but more importantly, it's your job to know them. What are they for? What do they mean? When do you use them? Um, so I will, I will not be of much help to you. That is your primary job. Don't be afraid to use some flashcards. Lots of practice. All right. Um, yeah, do a little algebra. Write your equation down if you know that's the equation you want. Um, arrange it so that the thing you don't know is on the, the left-hand side and the thing that you do know is on the right-hand side. And uh, you fill in, the, fill in all the little numbers. Uh, make sure you check your units with that. Put some units in there as well. Do the dimensional analysis. Make sure it comes out clean. <clears throat> Not only do you want to check your, your units at the end, check the physical uh, um, idea, right? If you've gone 50 meters in 10 seconds and your answer comes out to be a million meters per second, um, you've done something wrong, right? It should make some sort of sense with the problem that you're solving. And in the book, um, you'll find that they try to give you problems that are reasonable so that you can use your physical intuition to get those right. Um, biggest thing in the world is positive and negative signs. I'm going to teach you more about those later. They're very important. They're easy to lose. And you'll find me losing them all the time. So if you see me lose a negative sign, stop me. So this is not part of the problem solving strategy, just a quick summary. The equations are your tools. It is your one job, your primary job, to understand them, what they mean, and how to use them. They are not magic, they're tools, right? They're not the end-all gods of things, they, they just help you get to the answer. Your, the, the laws of physics are, are beyond them, yes? Um, carry the algebra as far as possible before you put any numbers in. Boy, I can't emphasize that enough. People want to put the numbers in right away. Always a big mistake. Um, and in a lot of problems, I won't give you any numbers. I'm like, solve the algebra for me. That's where the physics lies. It's much more important than the numbers. That's going to irritate you. I know that. Um, but that's part of the, the growing into being a physicist pro uh, process. Be neat. Be organized. Use lots of paper. Actually, in this case, case our class, we're going to be using lots of virtual space, right? Don't be afraid to add a new page if you're working with notability or explain everything. Add a new page. Give me some space. Draw big and then shrink it down. Use those iPads in such a way that you can be organized and neat, but um, not don't, don't make yourself feel crammed for space. Um, so this is the example that we're going to do. If you give me a moment, I will switch over to explain everything and solve this problem trying to use the outline that, uh, that we set up, okay? All right, let's see if we can solve this problem using the steps involved. Um, first step is to read the problem. A certain car is capable of accelerating at a rate of 10.60 meters per second squared. How long does it take the car to go from 55 meters per second to a speed of 60 meters per second? Don't want to bother you that I haven't taught you any of this physics yet, okay? I'm not expecting you to solve this problem. I just want you to see what the process looks like, okay? So we'll do this fairly quickly. We're going to draw ourselves a diagram. Zoom in here. And I will draw myself the car. As you can see, I am a highly trained artist. It's okay if your art isn't this good, right? And I'll put an arrow on it. going to the right in that direction, yeah? Alright, let's zoom back out here. 
So that's our before picture while it's going 55 meters per second, and now we're going to let it go 60 meters per second. All right, so let's just a little copy and paste to uh, cheat a little bit. Move him over here, and we'll put another arrow on him. There's another arrow. Um, let's see if we can adjust this arrow. Zoom in a bit. There we go. I'll zoom back out. Okay, so we've got our before and after picture. Each arrow sort of represents a different speed, yeah? Now it tells us to label um, the physical quantities, and I know that's probably the most mysterious of the instructions, but really what they're looking for is to give a variable to each thing. So I'm going to call this speed v1, and I'm going to call this speed v2. You might have called it v initial and v final, v before, v after, whatever you want, you get to label is fine. But I've got a v1 and a v2. Alright, next is to identify principles and list data. Well, the principles here are I've got something to do with acceleration and I've got something to do with velocity. I know that v1 equals 55 meters per second. V2 equals 60 meters per second. I know that A, A the acceleration is 10.60 meters per, oops, per second squared, and T equals, oops, equals question mark. I don't know what T is, but those are the three things I know and the one thing that I don't know. So choose an equation. I'm going to choose an equation that uses all of those things. And so I've got my notebook, I've got a bunch of equations that I've learned from Mr. Amoroso, um, and let's see which one works best. So I take a peek and I see, sure enough, A equals delta V over delta T, that's average velocity. Um, or average acceleration, which I've got. And the thing I'm looking for is delta t, yeah? So solve for the unknown quality without putting in any numbers yet. It's sort of the thing to do. So that's delta t equals delta v over a. That's, oops, v2, v final minus v initial, or v1 rather. over the acceleration. So this is equal to the answer that I'm looking for, right? That is just in um, letters, not in numbers yet. So now it becomes very easy to do the math, right? I get T, the thing that I'm looking for is 60 minus 55 divided by 10.60. That equals, let me get my calculator out. Correct number of significant figures, I get 0 0.47, um, and the units for that should be seconds. Yeah? Check your answer. Does that make sense? Sure, why not? It's not too fast. Half a second to, uh, to go that kind of acceleration? It seems okay to me. Uh, are the units right? Yes, definitely. They should be in seconds, and they are. Okay? So there's my um, solution to that problem.